Let me say, first of all, it is good to be back. It is enjoyable to do some traveling. We spent time with the family. I met the children in Florida, did the Disney thing, which I could have done without, but uh, with all the kids there, that's another story. But it was a very enjoyable time with the family. Uh, we, on the way down, uh, we were able to time our, our trip that we, were, we could stop in uh, St. Andrew's Church in uh, outside of Orlando, Florida with Pastor R.C. Sproul. It was quite an experience, uh, very different from what we have here. They're somewhat of a formal church, a uh, medieval type of a setting almost. The pulpit is about, I mean, it's about this big. He has to take several steps to get up into it. Uh, the, uh, the architecture is, is medieval and I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's breathtaking to many ways. The sermon wasn't bad, as <laughs> well, from, from, from Dr. Sproul. Uh, and then on the way back, I was, we, we were able to stop into a friend of ours in Gaston, North Carolina, Pastor Matthew Ryder. His dad has been here several times. And I contacted him Saturday evening, I believe, and said we'd be there. And he said, well, uh, but get ready to hear the same sermon because Pastor uh, Dalbert Tomlinson is preaching, uh, the, the guest speaker we had a few weeks ago. Uh, we got to hear him again, but it was a different sermon. It was very uh, good, a very good sermon, and we had a good time with them for the little time we were there. But I am thankful again for the prayers and for the safety uh, that, that we enjoyed uh, in our travels. We will today try to get back into the swing of things with the Gospel of John. As you know, we have been spending much time there. Uh, this is sermon number 26 in our series through the book of John. It's going to be quite a ways before we finish. Uh, but as uh, we continue, we're now in chapter 6. But let's ask the Lord's help as we open uh, the, the sermon. Lord, we pray now that you might be with us as we open your word. Lord, we realize that we are limited in our understanding, limited in our knowledge, in our ability to proclaim and to hear. I pray now, Lord, that you would help me through the power of your Holy Spirit to teach your word as it ought to be teach, uh, taught, and that you would help those who hear, that they may hear as it is to be heard, as words coming directly from you. Lord, I pray that I might be diminished and that you, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, may be exalted, may be glorify him this morning. May he be seen for who he is through your holy word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look to John chapter 6. Read the first verse, John chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. We now, as we look into John chapter 6, we are opening a chapter which is a rather lengthy chapter, 71 verses long. Now, you can rest assured that we will not cover all 71 verses this morning. We're going to look at the first 15 verses. This chapter, this section of John deals with a miracle which many of us have heard before. Uh, this is commonly called the feeding of the 5,000. As we'll see, there was many more than just 5,000 there, but we'll get into that. Uh, this is one of the more famous miracles. And if you were to talk to people on the street, some of them might be familiar with this. Now, most people know about the next one we'll look at next week, Lord willing. That is the walking on water when our Lord was out on the sea. Most people are familiar with that, uh, perhaps. But this particular miracle is the only miracle to be recorded in all four of the Gospels. You go to Matthew chapter 14, you'll find the miracle of the, the feeding of the 5,000 there, Luke chapter 9, and Mark chapter 6. Now, because we have all of this information, now many of the other writers recorded things which John did not, we're able to go back and we're going to pull a few of those things out as we go through our message. This is the largest miracle as far as the matter of participation goes with the Lord. Uh, there were probably twenty to 25,000 people that were involved directly in this miracle. Now, the other miracles that the Lord did, usually there's a handful of people or an individual, a uh, person is healed from their blindness. Uh, there was a little party of uh, people, the first miracle at the wedding when he turned the water into wine. Uh, there was a handful of people there, and only a few there actually knew the miracle had occurred. But this is one where thousands of people not only watched it, but actually partook 
of this miracle. They enjoyed the, the bread and the fish which was created by our Lord. So this is the largest of the miracles. Now, as we want to always remind us, is we're not looking at these things just to try to find some spectacular and interesting things to talk about. The purpose of John, and you could probably quote this because I've said it many times, is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is. Now, is Jesus a good teacher? Is he just a miracle worker? Uh, is he uh, just a, a rabbi of the Jews from the old ancient time? Who is he? Well, we know from John chapter 20 and verse 31. But these are written. Now, these things that we're studying, as we've been studying, are written. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So we are looking at these events in the life of the Lord Jesus and these miracles that he performed in order to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the, the creator of the world. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the purpose of this study, to show you who Jesus is. Jesus is not somebody to be trifled with. He's not somebody you can say, oh, that's good teaching. I, I can take part of it and leave it. No, he's the creator. He has all power, and we are responsible to him. Now, the second purpose of that was knowing those facts. We then, seeing who he is, are to believe in him. We are to trust in him. We are to commit our lives to him as Lord and Savior. We recognize him as king of kings. His word to us is law. That is the purpose of the Gospel of John, that we may have eternal life. Now, looking at the background of the events, we read chapter 1. Now, the events of chapter 5, the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem, and then the following confrontation with the Jewish leadership, that comprise chapter 5 this occurred between 6 months and a year before we're, we're, where we at or I'm sorry after before we get to John chapter 6 so there was about a 6 month to a year lull in, what the, in events here because John is jumping just from a couple of events in the Lord's life and emphasizing them in great detail and he skips over uh, a, a good portion of it but uh, the as we move to chapter 6, we then are looking at a, almost the beginning of the end of the ministry of the Lord. Because now he's going to this particular Passover, which is coming up soon. And the next Passover is the one where he's crucified. Now John the Baptist at this point had been beheaded. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 points that out. Now Jesus, after this, left the area. He crossed the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias and he was trying to find some rest and recuperation in a secluded area. And that's what he's doing at this point, the purpose of his coming over here. The problem, though, was that the crowds had seen his miracles and they wanted to see more of him. So they began following him. He got into the boat and he began crossing over to this secluded area and the crowd could see him from the shore. And they began running along the shore and following him, trying to determine where he was going. And once they did, they began to gather. And then you also had this Passover coming up soon, and there were travelers preparing for that. And they said, oh, look, there is Jesus, the one we've heard about. And the crowds began to swell. So by the time he got there, there wasn't much time for rest and recuperation. Now remember, the purpose of the Lord's miracles was not being fulfilled in, in a sense with these people. Now, the people were focusing on the miracles themselves, the spectacular type of situations that they, they come into and they, they would say, well, look at this or look at that. They weren't really looking at who he was and the, what the miracles were pointing to. They followed Jesus for the signs and for the miracles. However, once he got there and the, and the crowds came, it says he had compassion on them and he healed their sick in Matthew chapter 14. And in Luke chapter 9, it tells us that while these crowds were here, he also spoke to them about the kingdom of God. So he's teaching them spiritual truths 
and he's healing the sick. Now this went on all day until about mid-afternoon. The place was already packed with people. The disciples then were beginning to, to do some logistics. And they said, okay, we are in a very secluded area. We are far away from civilization. Kind of like where we live here. You know, people drive by here, they don't even know this place exists because we're in the middle of nowhere. But these people came from all the villages and they were away from their homes. And it was getting later. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, you, you need to do something about these people. Uh, they're going to go, go home hungry and it's going to be dark and they're not going to have any place to eat. So... Uh, we have them speaking to the Lord. Mark chapter 6, verse 36. The disciples suggested to Jesus that please dismiss the crowd, let them go home and get something to eat or find lodging somewhere along the way. Now this brings us to the main point of our story here in John chapter 6. Uh, verse 2, it says, Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now, he had some time with the disciples. The crowds then found where he was. They probably looked and there he is. And they began coming toward the Lord Jesus. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then, verse 5, Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing the great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So now we're looking at a, part, a good bit of this. John doesn't cover the healing and the teaching, he skips right over to the part of the crowd and Jesus uh, uh, dealing with the matter of their need of food. In chapter 6, verse 5. Now, remember, it was the disciples who initiated the conversation. Uh, they came to Jesus and said, we need to send these people home. Jesus then comes to Philip, verse 5. He says to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, Philip is put on the spot. And now we find the disciples being tested. More bluntly, Jesus says to the disciples in John chapter 9, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 9, verse 13, he says, You give them something to eat. They came to Jesus. Jesus, we have a problem. These people need to go home and eat. Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. And then he comes to Philip. Where can we go buy food? Philip, who is from the area, would know all where, all where the, uh, uh, the local stagers were, would be, where the Sam's Clubs would be. He did some calculating in his head. And he said, wait a minute. 200 denarii. It's so a verse 6. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. 200 denarii of bread is not sufficient for them. So there's a, there's a problem here. 200 denarii, that may have been what they had. We don't, we don't know for sure. That was equal to about eight months' pay for the average worker. A denarii was a silver coin, equal to about a day's wage. So you do the calculation, it's about eight months. And today's money at minimum wage is somewhere around $12,000. Yeah, so that, it was a significant amount. However... When you divide it among the people that were there, it comes to about 48 cents. 48 cents, maybe 60 cents a person. However, you also have to do some more calculating. Because today, food is much cheaper than what it was back then. We, how do we produce our food? Well, you can look around us. We have field after field after field of corn. Or we might have uh, potatoes or something like that. Why is there so much there? Because we have tractors. We have equipment. We have machinery. And even the Amish are able to produce a lot with what, what they use. Because they, they may not have the mechanized stuff, but they pull behind the machinery. None of this was available to them. Everything had to be beaten out of the earth with hard labor. So if you got yourself a handful of grain, it was bought with the sweat of your brow. Not only did you have to break up the claws, you had to remove the stones, you had to remove the weeds, and once you grew it, you had to cut it down by hand, and then you had to separate it by hand, the wheat from the chaff and all of that. All that was done by hand. And because of that, they didn't have the, the massive amount of food that we have today. And we can uh, stop to, at McDonald's 
and have a hamburger for what is a dollar twenty-five? I forget how much a hamburger is now, McDonald's. I mean, it's something relatively cheap. They couldn't even get meat. Most of those people would never have even a morsel of meat because the meat was too expensive for them. So you get the idea. The food was very expensive. So with that in mind, it was more like about maybe 15 to 25 cents, if that's being generous, per person to feed these people. Now, what can you buy now with 25 cents? Well, you get down to the dollar store, you, you might be able to get a handful of potato chips or something. You know, if you open the bag up and share with some, you know. But, uh, but you get the idea. There's not a whole lot of food here. So there's a problem. There's a logistics problem. Not only was they didn't have the money for it, there was no place to buy it. They're in the middle of nowhere. They're in the wilderness. So what are they going to do? Well, that's uh, Philip's dilemma. He says, Lord, we don't have enough money for this. So he's at his wit's end. The Lord tells him, you're going to provide, you guys provide the food for these people. And then he said, well, we don't have enough money. And there's no place to buy it. Well, then Andrew steps in, verse 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? So we have here that in the other gospel accounts, Mark chapter 6, we find that Jesus sent them into the crowd to see what, what was available, what type of food was there. Maybe there were some people following the crowd with a hot dog stand or something, you know, or you know uh, how these vendors will follow crowds along, uh, around to, to sell things. All they could find was these five loaves and two small fishes. Now, these loaves are not like the Wonder Bread that we have today. It comes in a bag, and it's about yay big. But these were the, the round, flat bread type, about as thick as your thumb, maybe a quarter inch to a half inch, and probably about as big as a tortilla. So there's five of those, and it says two fish, two small fish. The fish were intended to be like a garnishment on the bread. You'd maybe crumble up the, the fish on, on the bread, and you'd put a little flavor <laughs> On the bread, that was about all that was there. To give you the idea, this is, it was probably this boy's lunch, as, as many have said before. Andrew's response to this, this is what we found, Lord. But what are they among so many? What can we do with this? So we have to evaluate this. Both Andrew and Philip failed the test. Then, when the Lord says in verse uh, verse six, He said, "But this He said to test him." For he himself knew what he would do. The reason Jesus told them to do these things was to test them. Are they going to comprehend the spiritual truths here and the person who they're dealing with? And apparently they didn't. They said, we're at our wit's end. We don't know what to do. Well, let's evaluate it. First of all, this is an utterly hopeless situation. There's not enough money. There's no place to buy it. And there was a laughable supply of food. Can you imagine that? I mean, just try to picture the disciples. I think they were laughing when Andrew brought this up to them. Here's five loaves and two fish. Lord, we got this. I can just picture pfft, laughing at it. We're going to feed. They forgot who they were dealing with and they failed the test. And there's one thing we need to keep in mind Jesus commanded them to do it. It's impossible. There's no way to do it, but it's a command from the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord commands us to do something, he will provide the means by which to do it. We are not unable to do it if he commands it, because he provides. The disciples could only focus on the impossibility of the situation, and they failed to see the solution, and that solution was sitting right in front of them, the Lord Jesus Christ. What they should have done was saying, Lord, we can't do this. You must do this. They were, but they were at their wit's end trying to, to struggle to find a way. It's, it reminds me of Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of the dry bones. A question is asked. The Lord asks a question to Ezekiel. He says, Son of man... Can these bones live? Try to picture yourself. You're out in the field and you see a mass of dead human bones. Somebody asks you, is it possible to revive these bones? What would your answer be? 
Well, that would depend on who asked the question. If the Lord asked the question, Ezekiel had the right answer. He said, O Lord God, you know. So it is here. They're in an impossible situation. 20,000 to 25,000 people, because it's not just the men, it was women and children. And when you have men, you have women, and then you have children. And it was, the the commentators say, between 20 and 25,000 people. And they have a handful of food to feed these people with. Lord, you know what to do. And they failed that test. Now the sad truth is that they did not realize yet, despite all that they had seen, despite the the turning of water into wine, despite the healings that they watched and the, the miraculous things that Jesus did, all of them and many more that are not recorded in the Bible, they still didn't quite understand. The Lord of creation was the one who commanded them to do this and therefore they could do it. Psalm 78. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yet they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Instead of trusting, they were in utter confusion and frustration. Just as we are when we run into the bumps of life, isn't it? You know, the Lord has told us, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Look over to Matthew chapter 6, if you would. Matthew chapter 6, looking at verse 25. You know, we think, oh, those disciples, aren't they foolish? Are they, how could they not see it? You know, folks, we are exactly the same way. Look over Matthew Chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Look over to verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. Folks, we're in the same boat when you think about it. Bills come in, how are we going to pay them? We have responsibilities, how are we going to meet them? Now, I've I've been racking my brain over certain things I don't have control of. And I sat back and said, Lord, I can't do anything about these things. We go to the Scripture. We go to what the Lord has said. Seek first God's kingdom. Look first to spiritual things. Look first to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then all of these mundane things of life will fall into place. Now, we may not have that nice car that we want. It may not be God's will for us. We may not be able to make the payments on that. But He will take care of us. He will supply our needs. That's the promise that He's given us. And we then are to trust in Him. Ask and it will be given You seek and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. We are equally as blind as the disciples when facing such situations. We face them all the time as well. But we worry and we fret and we beat our heads against the wall and things that we have no control of. We need to come to Him. Lord, I give these things to You. I can't handle these things on my own. And then we have the Lord's solution. Look down to verse 10, back to John chapter 6. The Lord's solution. Make, then Jesus said, make the people sit down. At this point, the Lord takes the situation completely out of their hands. He says, okay, we're done with the testing. 
Now we're going to solve the problem, and it's going to come through him, through the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, make the people sit down. Now we're told that there was much grass in the place. It was similar to a large pasture. You can picture this, a lot of the open areas we have around here, big fields where you could fit a large number of people. Of course, around here you have to be careful where you sit because of the horses and the cows and stuff. But he makes them sit down, and they all sat down picnic style, and they were put in ranks of 50 and 100. Now what they did was they made people like little patches of garden. Now you'll have a garden where you, you're able to get in between things so you can take care of your garden. You may have a section here and a section here and a section here. That's what they did with a crowd. Now if you have one big massive crowd, it's hard to, to deal with, with 20,000 people at one time. So what they did is they divided them up in ranks of 50s and 100s. Probably according to the heads of household and whatnot. And then they were able to deal with them. Then Jesus gave thanks. We find verse 11. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. Now we have here something I think we, we can't overlook. Now Thursday, as many of you know, is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the most overlooked holiday in the, in the holiday calendar. And I was surprised. We were in Florida, and this was beginning, very beginning of November. I, I can't remember the dates now, but... But several weeks ago, last week, week before, we're in Florida, and nothing is mentioned about Thanksgiving at, at the park. There's a huge Christmas tree, and already we're singing Christmas songs and lights. But where's Thanksgiving? We had Halloween, and then we bypass Thanksgiving and jump right into Christmas. It's just overlooked. Why? Because we don't have any concept of the God who provides all these things for us. And we don't give thanks anymore to God. You know, our nation officially established the holiday of Thanksgiving for the purpose of thanking God for what he has done. And this goes back to the pilgrims. They did not sit down and, and thank each other and thank the Indians, as we're taught many times in school. But they sat down and thanked God for what he had provided for them. You know, something interesting about that, and I forget the exact number, but we did it one year with candy corn. For many years after that, the pilgrims would have a meal of Thanksgiving, and they would have, I think, five or six kernels of corn sitting beside their meal of the, of the turkey and cranberry sauce, whatever else they ate back then. And these five kernels of corn were there to remind them of what it was like before God had blessed them. What they had went through, the starvation they went through. You know, we don't have that, do we? Any of you remember when you didn't have enough to eat? It's difficult for us to comprehend that. My, my grandmother went through the Great Depression. I remember as a child at eating my food, and, and she would watch my plate. There'd be a little bit left on my plate. She said, Jeff, you need to eat that. Said, Grandma, I'm full. Eat it. Don't ever leave any food. Don't take any food you're not going to eat. And make sure you eat what you take. Because to her, food was very precious. She remembered going out into the woods, picking blackberries, and that being a meal for them, because that's all they had during the Depression. We, on the other hand, all of us, most of us, some of you may have gone through some pretty tough times, but for the most part, our people in this country don't know what it's like to go without. And so when we are full, we don't realize the blessing that we have. The Lord gave thanks, even for that little bit that they had. He then breaks the bread. He distributes it to the disciples. And remember, all these people are now in hundreds of groups of fifties and hundreds. And he then goes through breaking this bread, and they begin passing it out. And it just keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. He's breaking it, and it keeps going. They fill the, a, a basket full, and they take it over, they distribute it, they come back, he keeps breaking it and breaking it and breaking it. And then the fish, the same thing with the fish, over and over, and, and these people are walking over, and they're eating, and they're eating, and they're eating. And we find verse 11, that they had as much as they wanted. Not only did they fill their stomachs, but these people were saying, this is wonderful, this is amazing. They began filling their pockets. I mean, just picture these people. 
Now, remember, we know what it's like to be full. You know, we were traveling back and we stopped at a Golden Corral, which is a big, big mistake. Never stop at a Golden Corral when you're traveling. I guess be careful. I shouldn't. I might get sued here. But any any place where it's all you can eat, you sit down, you eat, and oh, that's good. I think I'll try a little this, a little this. Okay, I have another six hours to drive. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, we know what it's like to be full. These people, some of them, never had that experience in their life. They live day to day with a handful of food to keep them alive, and all of a sudden they're being handed. All of this food, they're full, there's no place else to put it, they start stuffing it in their pockets. He keeps breaking it and breaking it and giving it out, the bread and the fish. They were filled, they took as much as they wanted and they were filled. And then when finally the disciples are with, going out among them with the the bread and the fish, they're saying, we can't take any more. They come back to Jesus and they say, they're full now. There was 12 baskets left of all the, the fragments that Jesus had broken that was not distributed. Eat one for each of the disciples, probably for the next several days of food. So that's the story. We're all familiar with the story. How can, what can we learn from the story? First of all, what you see in the Scripture is a genuine miracle. Now, there wasn't a problem with that until about 150 years ago, until liberalism began sneaking into the churches. And they looked at this and they, start to, they started throwing away all of the miraculous things in the Bible. Ah, well, we can't have that. There has to be natural explanations. They, believe it or not, I've actually looked into commentaries and they've had other explanations for what happened. Now, one is, well, what it actually was, was just a communion type of a service. You know how we have, a, have communion here where we pass out the plate. It has little bits of cracker there for us to take and little cups of juice to take. And they, some people say it was like that. But the, and it's just somewhat exaggerated to show the spiritual benefit that the people had. Another explanation is that the people, the, mer- the actual miracle was not the multiplication of the food, but the, the people actually had this stuff stashed away. And in their hearts, their hearts opened up and their greed was gone and they began sharing with each other. And that was the miracle. Uh, that is just downright ridiculous. The scriptures are clear. This is a genuine miracle and the purpose is to show you you are dealing with the creator of the universe. He wants to feed the the 20,000. He can feed the 20,000 if he desires to. Even if there's nothing there, if there's no place to buy the food, there's not enough money that he can provide the food. That was the purpose to show who Jesus was. It's not a sleight of hand or psychological trick. He fed them with grain that had never grown in the ground. He fed them with fish that had never swam in water. He was a creator. It went straight from his hand, a creation, to their mouth. Because he is the Son of God. It reveals who Jesus is. He is the one that we must submit to as Lord and King. He is our provider. He is our creator. There is none like him. All others are frauds. When you see them on TV and they're pretending to heal people, they're frauds. When you see a prophet who claims to be coming and teaching us the ways of Allah, just go blow people up and you'll get to go to heaven. He's a fraud. All others are frauds. Only Jesus is the truth. He is the one. This also points out the difficulty of faith. Jesus was right in front of them. They had seen him work before. But yet they still couldn't figure it out. Now, the reason for that is faith is a very difficult thing. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we live in this life. We exist here on earth. We watch, we observe things as they happen, and we know how things are supposed to work out. If I drop my pen, it's going to fall and hit the ground. But this is something that's out of the ordinary. This is miraculous. This would be like dropping my pen and the pen floats up into the air on its own. Something strange is happening. It's supernatural. It's not something we see all the time. So for us to have faith in Jesus who sat there as a man, like the rest of the disciples, they had a hard time connecting this. That he had that kind of power. And they, they had a very weak faith. They were, they were disciples of little faith. But we also need to 
strengthen our faith through the word of God, the hearing of the word of God and through prayer. Applying the truths of scripture requires faith. That there is a life beyond. Because if you follow Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you. You may lose your job. You may lose your money. You may lose your family. You may lose everything. Is it worth it? If you know the scripture, you believe the scripture, you know that if you give everything up in this life, that there is another life that is much greater blessed than this life. An eternal life. You know that from the scripture, that requires faith. If we don't have that, then it's going to be difficult for us so according to the, the, the amount of faith that we have, it's difficult for us to comprehend these spiritual things and to apply them to our lives. Like Abraham looked for a city, but he looked for a spiritual city. He had faith. We are to trust and believe the scripture. That to lose our life for Christ's sake is to truly gain it. You know, you wonder, you look at what, what's happening to the Christians in the Middle East. And you see them sitting there with their hands behind their back. And you see those monsters, those satanic monsters, who are giving their speeches and then killing them and beheading them. How can they do that? They lose everything in this life. They can do that because they have an eye of faith. They know that Jesus Christ is real. They know that His Word is real and that He is worth everything, including losing their head for. And they do so. That is faith. The sad thing is that though so many thousands of people enjoyed this miracle, few of them really followed the Lord Jesus Christ and believed in Him. Even a great miracle like this cannot convert the heart. You know, we'll go down here through the rest of the chapter. It's 72 verses, so it's going to be a few more sermons. We're going to find that these people are going to start doubting and questioning Jesus. They're going to, whenever, whenever he finally confronts them as individuals, we're going to find out that there's unbelievers. And they were there enjoying the bread, but they didn't believe in him. They thought he had some type of trick or, or whatever. They, they didn't believe in Jesus, even though they were eating the bread that he produced through miraculous ways. Miracles cannot save people. They failed to hear the message of Jesus and see him as their deliverer from sin. They then wanted to force him into their mold. They wanted to make Jesus what they, what they wanted him to be. You know, we, we close here with the last two verses. Verse 13. Therefore they gathered up, they gathered them up and filled 12 fragments. Uh, down to verse 14, I'm sorry. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is coming into the world. So far, so good. He's the prophet that Moses spoke of that was coming. However, look to the next section, next verse. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. They came and they had decided that, hey, if this man can do this, he has an army already here. And we're ready to go. Remember, there's 5,000 men mentioned that were there. These men would have taken up arms for him. And they were organizing themselves to do so. And he had to put a stop to it. They wanted a physical king. And Jesus would have no, nothing to do with it. There's another picture here, and I'll just kind of throw this in. You know, the politicians that are most popular, the ones that are out buying votes right now, Hey, you vote for me and I'll fill you full of bread and fish. Jesus, if he wanted the power, he could have stepped right here. I am. I'll be your king. Instead, he slips away. His kingdom was not of this world. Or his servants would fight. But his kingdom was a heavenly kingdom. And this heavenly kingdom involves repentance from sin. And belief in the true and only God and his son, Jesus Christ. That's his kingdom. But they wanted to by force. And that means to literally drag him, to bound him, and force him then to be king. You can do this, you're going to be our king. 
Jesus would have nothing of it. You cannot force Jesus into the mold you think he ought to be in. When you try to do that, what's he do? It says here he departed. Went off to, to, to be by himself. Even the disciples were, were getting into this. So, wow, this is wonderful, Jesus, what you've done. And the people started saying, we're going to make him king. And they jumped right on the bandwagon. Jesus slipped away. Because he would have nothing to do with it. If you fail to see Jesus as your deliverer from sin, he will not permit you to attach him to your life as you see fit. He is to be your deliverer from sin, your Lord and your God. He is most willing that all who would come to him, that he's open for anyone to come, but it's on his terms. It's not on your terms. It's all or nothing with Jesus. You forsake all and follow him. It's not like, oh, I have this particular sin and I enjoy this sin. Can I hold on to this sin and come? No. It's all or nothing. I love this world. Can I bring this world with me and follow Jesus? No. It's all or nothing. For those who do forsake all and follow Jesus, there is blessings in this world, spiritual blessings, blessings of having true friends and family in his church, and there is blessings in the world to come in eternal life. That is, if you follow the true Jesus as he has told us to do so and trusting completely in him. And let's bow for prayer.